So, uh, hello everyone, my name is Mark Gaylor. I am from uh, Microsoft and I'm an open software lead for Microsoft and uh, my job is to uh, 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 work with uh, governments and organizations to help them release the power of uh, data that's held within their organizations. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, open data and the business potential of open data. Of course, coming from Microsoft, I'm going to talk about technology, but I'm not really going to go into technology in too much detail. And my, the, where I'm coming from about technology is really how we can use technology to unleash the business value of open data. Uh, I will uh, uh, allow some time at the end for questions. So um, I'll make sure that you guys, if there's things that you need me to clarify as we go along, I'll make sure that we have time at the end for you to ask me questions. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the, uh, the organizers and Mirko in particular for inviting us to uh, present at this event. Uh, it's, it's been a great event with lots of different things going on and I, I hope you enjoy this session as well. So before I get into detail about uh, the business potential for open data, I kind of want to set the scene. Um, I know many of you here are familiar with open data concepts and open government initiatives. And it's interesting that we're already starting to see some uh, clear evidence of business value coming out of open government and open data initiatives worldwide. Um, and this, this value, the value of course has, uh, occurs differently depending upon who we're looking at, who we're talking about. From a citizen perspective, citizens really want better services, right? They want to be engaged by the government in ways that suit them rather than the way that government decides it's convenient for them to, suit, to, to engage citizens. For government workers, government workers want access to data. They want to know, understand how best to improve government and how to deliver better citizen services. And for leaders, of course, leaders want to connect with the citizens and communities more broadly. You know, in, in, in broader ways, more inclusive ways, and ways that really drive innovation into the economy. So this is kind of the backdrop for the potential for open data and open government initiatives. While this is happening, we're also seeing changes and opportunities arising out of technology development. Consumers, of course, now have a variety of different devices. They have mobile devices, PCs, Android devices, iOS devices. It's, and citizens are expecting to be engaged the way they want to be engaged, the way it's convenient for them. Uh, in addition to this, we're seeing a massive explosion of available data. You think about it, data is now hitting us uh, every day in a, in a variety of different ways. And particularly when we look at the amount of data that, that, that can potentially be shared by governments, and when we look at things like big data that's coming out of science, research, uh, the, academic, uh, uh, the academic world, there is a ton and, and growing amounts of data that can potentially drive business value in the economy. Also, we see a rise in the availability of cloud computing. Cloud computing is driving down the cost of being able to develop new applications and services. And cloud computing is also driving the ability to use a variety of different devices, access devices, different types of software, different types of hardware even. <clears throat> so because of this backdrop, we see uh, worldwide many, many uh, open government initiatives and open data projects occurring. Um, we see them occurring in different countries in different regions we see them occurring in developed nations and emerging markets it's very interesting uh, I was recently working with the World Bank and the World Bank are actually tying some of their investment funding uh, to countries that are demonstrating their ability to exploit open data for business value so it's interesting that we're starting to see some of these uh, in, uh, ties with investment and uh, economic activity even at national level in some countries, of course, open data is occurring at a, a, a at federal level or national level, top down, as we say. Uh, so that would be the case in the UK and the USA, for example. But in other countries, we're seeing it occur from the bottom up, where it's, there isn't a national policy or maybe not a, a mature national policy around open data. And what we see is that cities and states are actually driving uh, the thinking and driving the adoption of open data in their countries. And the reason for this is quite simple. If you think about it, 
open data becomes more meaningful, meaningful, meaningful to us as individuals when it has local relevance. So if I give you a very simple example, um, if we take, say, like uh, flu virus. So if, uh, if we look at statistics around flu virus, our nation may publicize that there are so many uh, uh, cases of flu virus or occurring or, or growing at a national level. Well, this is interesting, and obviously we would, we would be concerned, and we hope the government is doing something about the flu virus. But if we now know that there are 12 cases of flu virus in the school district where my children go to school, now I can take action as an individual. This means something to me as an individual. And so this is why we often see city data and local data uh, becoming more, fr frankly, more interesting and more exciting to us as individuals, and we see a lot of applications and services being developed around that data. Um, one of the other things that we're seeing from a technology perspective is, of course, an importance and reliance on open data standards, open standards. Uh, and one of the ones I'm going to talk to you today is something called OData, which is really enabling cloud platforms to make it very easy to get data into cloud platforms in a very open way and to get it out of cloud platforms in a very open way. So let's look at some examples of business value. This is the open business track after all, and I think that's what you guys are really interested in is, okay, great, but what, is, what are we seeing in terms of business value for open data? We're already seeing some examples. I mean, this is a very difficult subject. There is no clear uh, 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 answers to all of this today, uh, but we're already seeing some evidence and some examples of how business value is being driven out of the use of open data. Uh, there are studies, of course, the Australian Bureau of Statistics have done studies which show that uh, the economic value of open data in Australia is worth around 25 million US uh, Australian dollars, I should say, at a cost of around less than 5 million Australian dollars. And this is an interesting ratio. I'm going to talk a bit more detail about this in a second. Um, another example, of course, many of you will be familiar with the European Commission that's done the study on public sector information, reuse of PSI in, in, across the EU, and the stated value, the economic value of that data is around 50 billion euros. In Canada, they discovered that by using open data for fraud detection of charities, they could potentially realize a saving to the government and to the taxpayer of around 3.2 billion dollars. And it was very simply done. What they did was they rated charities in terms of charitable contributions from highest to lowest. And it turned out that the top two charities on the list, nobody would ever heard of. So there was a, a fraudulent activity being, com, uh, being committed here. And this was realized through the publishing of open data. And of course, a very well-known example, uh, the, the apps, for, apps for Democracy competition that was done by Washington, D.C., the city of Washington, D.C., uh, they had an apps, for, uh, uh, an apps development competition using their open data sets which generated 47 applications over a period of 30 days. They calculated that the value to the city of these applications was around $2.3 million and yet the outlay cost for them was only $50,000. So again, another example of business value being driven out of the publishing of open data. So, some other examples we can see, there have been various surveys and studies done in different countries. And I'm not going to go into this chart in detail, but what I want to draw your attention to is that the business value of data changes depending upon the nature of the data itself. So if we look here, you will see that in particular, geospatial data, GIS data, data that has uh, mapping and location information in it, in particular, has a richer val tends to have a richer value than say traditional government data, maybe government data about government facilities or budgeting, things like that. And the reason this is very interesting is there's two reasons. First of all, it, it talks back to this point about value ratio. You remember in the earlier slide I said that the Australian Bureau of Statistics have done studies that show the ratio of value to cost with open data is around five to one. When you look at geospatial data, GIS data, that goes up to actually greater than 20 to one ratio. So that's why that's interesting is it depend, you know, it can, the value can vary depending upon the data type. But the second reason this is interesting is because it also talks to the point about governments being able to make money out of open data. And I know for some of you this might be kind of counterintuitive. You might be thinking, well, surely all open data has to be free. 
And of course, there's, a, there's an argument to say that that should be the case. What I would say, though, is that you can have open data, and you can have free open data, of course. But I would also say that what it does is it enables governments to be more legitimate about the situations where they can charge a fee for a data service that they're actually providing. And these two, in my opinion, are not mutually exclusive. So what I mean by that is today, I mean, we're being shared, data is being provided to us by the government every day. So today uh, in Canada, if I want to get a building permit, one way I can do that is I can go into my local town hall and I can go to the city clerk and they can print out a form and they give me a building permit based on some criteria, of course, and I get charged a fee for that. And that fee really is a processing fee. It doesn't really add value to the process per se, it's just enable that clerk to give me a bit of paper with a building permit on it. And yet if I share that data online, the government doesn't really need to charge me for that, right? I'm a taxpayer already. You know, there's an argument to say I already have rights to that data. And so I think this, this data value concept creates a very interesting discussion and kind of forces, encourages governments to be more legitimate about where they're adding value to a service on which basis they can legitimately charge for that data. So this is something worth thinking about. So as we look at uh, publishing of open data, we're also learning that just publishing open data itself, it's, 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 it's not the end of the story. And just walking around today, some of the other presentations, some of the work that's being done in Germany, Austria, Switzerland is very, very impressive in terms of setting up data portals, open data portals, open data catalogs. But if we're really going to realize the business value of open data, just publishing in a catalog, it's one activity, but it's, it's, we need to do more than this. And if you look at this diagram, what we're kind of illustrating here is that open data is an important part of an overall government information architecture. And it's important that data is shared in a way that it's open, of course, that goes without saying, but also that we can take data from different sources, various operational systems perhaps, various external sources. We can provide uh, data in a way that it's easy to mash up and that it's easy to consume by citizens with different access devices and different access methods, but also by developers to build new data and services with that, uh, new, new applications and services with that data. Because if we just share data in a catalog and nobody uses it, or no applications or services are built with it, then we're not re realizing the business value of that data, okay? So we're going to talk a bit more about that as we go through this, uh, this presentation. So now it's, a, it's an opportune moment for us to talk about cloud. Because given that we're saying, well, we want to release business value, we want to enable business value out of open data, we can look at different types of technology, but a real enabling technology that's out there today are cloud platforms. Cloud platforms are ideal for encouraging or enabling the business value and business potential of open data. Why is this? First of all, clouds are highly scalable. Cloud platforms are highly scalable. Uh, you can start low, you can start with small amounts of data, you can increase the amount of data and the amount of transactions related to your data in a very scalable way, but still in a very cost-effective way. And I'm going to give you some examples of this as we go through. Secondly, the, 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 uh, the entry cost for cloud is, is minimal. I mean, and I mean minimal. It's almost zero. Uh, we have, uh, we've worked with customers in uh, small cities in North America where they've built uh, new uh, open data portals in a couple of days uh, and they're running their entire open data catalog for less than $250 a month, just to give you an idea. So cloud is very affordable, very cost effective, start small, scale up to high. Thirdly, cloud is very open. So the cloud platforms enable you to put, bring data in, in uh, from various uh, uh, sources, in various formats, various standards, and it's very easy to get data out of the cloud in a very open way, independent of the access device, browser, or whatever it might be. So let me give you one example of this concept of scalability in the cloud. Uh, one application that's been developed, some of you may be familiar with it. This was an application service developed in conjunction with the European Environment Agency, and it's called Eye on Earth. And what Eye on Earth does, Eye on Earth enables the publishing of air 
uh, air uh, quality, water quality and noise quality data across the European Union. And what's very interesting about this application is it, ma it makes it very easy to connect with citizens and to enable citizens to vote and to assess the quality of that data. And the way they do this is with a very simple SMS-enabled device. So why would they do that? Well, you can imagine if the uh, European Environment Agency is publishing this data, they are using citizens to tell them if this data is accurate or not. Is, is the water quality accurate or not, where I am? So what's great about this is the government saying, okay, or the government agency in this case is saying, here, we think the water quality at this location is X, we think it's good, but the citizen can actually vote or, or rate the quality of the data at that location by saying, well, I'm there. What is this location on here? It's, uh, it looks like it's uh, oh, Czech Republic in this particular example. I'm actually at that location and I can tell you that the uh, water quality is bad. And so they're using crowdsourcing to help them understand about the, the quality of water, air and noise in a particular area and whether they need to do something about that. It might be a data issue, of course but it might be a genuine water quality issue. And so this is a way that the European Environment Agency are engaging citizens in helping them improve the overall quality of their service. In the UK, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with data.gov.uk. Uh, data.gov.uk runs on, uh, uh, the front end runs on the CCAN open source portal. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, but the back end uh, for weather data uh, runs on Windows Azure. Which is a which is a, a cloud computing platform, which is the cloud computing platform from Microsoft, and the reason that they chose Azure was because of the sheer volume of data and transactions that's going through this weather data. This is national weather data that's updated hourly and published to data.gov.uk. So you can imagine how big and how heavy that data is. Plus, it potentially can be accessed by all the citizens across the UK and, frankly, the world. So this is a great, another great example of how cloud computing can provide scale and accessibility and openness at very, very low cost. Another example I want to give you is uh, combining open data with social media. Uh, this is a great way, again, to, to provide that citizen engagement. You know, earlier on we talked about this is why one of the reasons open data is being published is to make the connection with the citizens to, uh, 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 to, to engage citizens in making the service or the, uh, the, the provision that the government is making easier or better quality. So what we're seeing is that open data applications and open data services are being combined with social media to uh, make a better connection with the citizens and to reach more citizens, to be more, a broader inclusion, uh, more inclusive of different types of uh, uh, citizen groups. So this is an example of an application called Flood Alerts on Facebook. And what this application does is it just gives you a warning about where floods may be occurring in the UK. And again, if you think about the access uh, uh, that, that people would have through Facebook and through other devices, you want to make sure that this service is provided independent of that access. Cloud, compute it, let, cl cloud computing lends itself very well to these open scenarios. And of course, mobile apps. I'm sure many of you are using mobile apps already with open data. Uh, if we put data in the cloud, we can develop apps or encourage the development of apps on Android, on iOS, on Windows 8. And these are just examples for, of uh, Windows 8 apps that have been developed uh, for mobile uses based on that data.gov data that I mentioned earlier on. So let me, let me give you some facts and figures about some of these applications, just again to bring home the scalability of this data and how uh, cloud really enables this data to be used for business value. So first of all, that weather data that I mentioned earlier on, there are about 250 million rows of data that are updated per hour. The cloud is ideal for enabling this to happen at a, in a very cost-effective and open way. For Transport for London, they share uh, near real-time data about uh, the London Underground trains. This is the number one most popular open data solution across Europe, and it gets about 2.3 million hits per day from all kinds of mobile applications running on different operating systems. 
this data is stored in the cloud. And again, this is an ideal example of why you would put this data in the cloud, making it available to different types of services and many, many citizens across the country and potentially across Europe. Just to give you an idea, when Transport for London uh, implemented this service, it actually represented a cost saving for them from an infrastructure point of view of around two million pounds. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology here, but actually instead of talking about it, I'm going to give you a quick demo. Um, so uh, Microsoft have a couple of offerings that, that uh, enable data to be published in the cloud. One is called the Open Government Data Initiative, or OGDI. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may be, even be working with it. OGDI uh, is basically an open API that sits on the cloud. It makes it very easy to get data into the cloud, and it makes it very easy to get data out of the cloud. <clears throat> the Data Lab component of OGDI is, uh, basically enables you to set up a self-service open data portal uh, on the Windows Azure system, and you can put data in in a variety of formats, and you can get data out in a variety of formats. The Data Lab code we make available as open source, available on GitHub, so it's a free open source uh, solution. I know that may be a surprise to you because I'm speaking from Microsoft, so I'll say it again. It's a free open source solution available from Microsoft, enabling you to easily get data into the cloud and out of the cloud. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, uh, the interface, but I'd like to actually show you this because there's a couple of really cool features that really talk to this open aspect very well. Would you guys like to see a demo rather than me sitting up here talking about it? Yes? Great. So just bear with me while I switch out here. Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is the interface of the o, uh, OGDI, which is this open API. So one of the things I can do, uh, I can switch the language here, so I'll switch it over to German. Um, and I'm just going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick a data source here, just kind of at random. By the way, those of you who like to see the Microsoft guys squirm when they're doing a demo, in case the demo goes wrong, this could be the bit that will really entertain you. So we'll see how it goes. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, uh, let's see, we'll pick an Austrian example. And I'll just pick, um, oh. so I'm just going to filter on one of the Austrian uh, data sets. So I'm just going to pick one of these and we'll have a look inside the data. So what you're looking at here, this is a portal set up for, the, uh, with, uh, for European Union data, by the way. So this web, uh, the web interface, the frame that you see on the outside, this is running in a traditional web infrastructure. So it's hosted on-premise. It's, in uh, it's a typical web application. This component here, the API that you're seeing, is actually running in the cloud. So what you can see is that the cloud and your regular web infrastructure are very seamless. So the fact that this data is hosted in the cloud and running in the cloud. We don't know. We don't really care. It's very seamless. So what you're seeing here is we're looking into the data set. So this is just a snapshot of the data set. Um, if I'm a citizen, I can use this to browse the data. If I'm a developer, I can use it to check it's the data that I'm really interested in. But I want to show you a feature of this that, that really demonstrates the openness of the cloud platform. So here you can see um, a developer interface. And what this does is it not only publishes the data for citizens,
but it also enables drives uh, 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 it drives the the, uh, the publishing of the code for different app, uh, different developer tools. So if I click on the drop down, here you can see there's some ASP code. Uh, so this API supports different development tools. So it's very independent of those development tools. So if I click on PHP, you will notice in a second that uh, we can generate code in different formats, PHP, Python, Ruby, etc., etc. And what this means is that the developer, all they have to do is to pick that code out of this API and drop it straight into their application. And what's really good about this is that it kind of addresses two challenges that governments have when they're publishing data. One, what format and what standard do I need to publish the data in? Number two, how do I encourage developers to take up this data? So this API really addresses that middle ground of those challenges and does both. It, it, it makes it easy for governments to publish data in an open way, and it makes it easy for developers to consume that data. OK. So back to the presentation. Uh, another uh, 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 offering that uh, Microsoft makes available is something called Data Market. So you remember earlier on when I said that uh, uh, using the cloud, governments have the opportunity to share open data in a free way. They also have the opportunity to provide data to, for commercial use, which enables them to charge a fee for that data. As I mentioned earlier, these, things, these two things do not necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. It can be the same data set stored in the cloud, but I can provide a free offering and I can provide a commercial offering. And again, our expectation is that a commercial offering would have some value added service that the government provides on top of it. So as a citizen or a developer, I have the choice. I can take the free open data offering, if that's what I want, the raw source anonymized data, or I can take the commercial offering where uh, the government has provided some value added service on top of that data. And again, where we commonly see these value added services in rich data, like geospatial data, where they're doing mapping work with it, uh, ordnance survey, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And there's many examples that around the world where government agencies are providing that data on a commercial basis. The other thing that's important about this data is that it's easy to get in and out of our existing infrastructure. So as we know, many government workers have different uh, productivity tools. And so not only is it important for us to get that data out in an open way to citizens and developers, but we also want it to make it easy for government analysts to use that data uh, for internal mashup purposes. So again, I'm going to attempt to give you a quick demo of how this can be done in a very open uh, way with the data that's available in the cloud. So again, just bear with me for a second. So what I have here is uh, a data catalog that was built by the Italian Ministry of Health. So again, I'm just going around. These are real live open data sites. So I'm just going around from site to site just to pick out data, just again to show you how easy this is and how open this really is with the cloud computing platform. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very simple query here, and I want you to see what happens to the URL as I do that simple query. By the way, my Italian isn't great, so I'm kind of working in the dark here. So what I've done there is I have, um, I've selected a very simple query string, and I've just extracted the data out of this data set, uh, which is equal to 201. It's a code. This is a health data set, and the code represents something for the, the Italian Ministry of Health. I don't know what it, what it does. But, but what I wanted to show you was that I can do a basic query, and notice what this API does. It builds that URL for me, OK? And if you remember Tim Berners-Lee's criteria for open data, 
He says that obviously it's good for governments to share data. They get one star for that. Uh, they get two stars if they share it in a proprietary format, machine readable. They get three stars if they share it in an open format. And they get four stars if they share it using open URIs. And that's what this is. And I want to show you, uh, give you one example of why this is very powerful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that URI. That's all I'm going to do. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch Excel, and I'm going to launch a feature of Excel called Power Pivot. And what Power Pivot enables me to do is it enables me to connect to any open data feed. And I'll just show you how this works. Hopefully it's going to work. So at the top here, uh, for those of you who have used uh, Excel 2010, Power Pivot was a down free downloadable uh, 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 extension. In Excel 2013, uh, it's just a, uh, an add-in that gets added to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the menu bar at the top. This is the customer preview of Excel 2013. So again, I'm hoping this is going to work. Uh, let's see. So what I'm doing here is I'm using Power Pivot to access this OData feed. So again, think of me as a business analyst in this scenario. I have no idea what, the, what, data this format, uh, what format this data is in. I have no idea what the source data is in. I'm just using an, uh, an open data standard to get this data into my productivity tool. So this will probably take a little while because it depends on the internet connection and uh, like I said, hopefully it's going to work. Um, so what I've just done there is I've taken data out of an open cloud repository and I've just brought it in through an open data feed into my productivity tool. And this is using an underlying protocol called OData. OData is a protocol that's jointly developed by Microsoft, IBM, SAP, Citrix, and other organizations. Um, and it enables me to get data in and out of cloud and in and out of other data, data uh, uh, applications and service, services in a very open, easy way. So what you've just seen is that I'm, as a data analyst, I can take data out of an open data catalog in a very easy, seamless, open way. And I don't need to know what source data it is. I don't need to know what format it is. I can just use these open data feeds to move data around. <clears throat> and that's what you saw. And that's what you see in this diagram here. But what I've done is uh, rather than uh, talk to the slide, I've just given you a quick demo of that. OK. The other thing we're seeing with open data, and that it is also enabled by this ability to mash up data from different sources, is that government agencies are now using this data and combining it with big data sources and performance data from different departments. This is being used internally for governments to provide mashup up uh, 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 applications, and also dashboards. This one is from the city of Barcelona that was recently developed. So it combines open data, it combines internal performance data, and it combines uh, sources of big data together. And again, the cloud is really, really ideal at doing this. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up here and give, uh, have, uh, open up uh, for questions. So really what we're talking about is, the, is, is, is an, uh, having cloud in, uh, enabling the business value of open data, enabling it to be realized. The cloud enables new innovative applications and services to be built on those data sets. It enables data to be easily published by governments in a very open way, independent of the access device or software. 
It enables new applications and services themselves to be built in the cloud at very low cost. And yet it also allows very high scalability, big data, millions and millions of transactions, millions and millions of updates to millions and millions of citizens. And of course, it enables tremendous insight both for government workers, but also citizens as well. So I hope you enjoyed that. It was a quick tour through open data from a Microsoft perspective. Um, and uh, I'll open up to the floor for questions. Yes. Thank you very much. I was curious about your revenue stream in your department. What, what's gonna, what's, how do you make money in your department working with uh, open government data? How do I make money personally? <laughs> uh, so, so I think, is your question about how does Microsoft make money? Yeah, yeah, so it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. So uh, quite frankly, the way Microsoft makes money out of this is by uh, data being hosted on our cloud platform. Um, so you might think, aha, that's the catch. The, you know, Microsoft is, is, wants to make money out of this. Well, of course, we're a commercial organization. That kind of goes without saying. However, I want to give you some examples of what kind of revenues we're talking about. So uh, we've done work with many different cities, many different government agencies, national, state, and city level. And just to give you an idea of the kind of cost we're talking about, uh, the city of Berlin, I think the population's, what, about three, three million, four million, something like that? Okay. So just to give you an idea, and you can't quote me on this, but if I was to estimate, if we took all of the data that the city of Berlin has and we hosted it in the cloud the way I showed you, the way I demonstrated here, it would cost around 700 euros per month to run using this method. So of course, Microsoft has an interest in this from a commercial point of view, but really for us, it's about cloud adoption and getting different open projects, open source projects, open data projects running on our open cloud platform, more so than revenue. And that's kind of why I wanted to give you that example. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. For me, it seems to be too easy to get into these solutions. Sorry? Can you hear me? OK. For me, it seems to be too easy uh, to get this solution uh, because normally in IT projects you have aggregation of data, you have difficult processes there and uh, the data quality itself uh, for big data is uh, an enormous problem. So you mentioned uh, that you get revenues for, of billions uh, from these projects. Can you explain it in more detail? Uh, yeah, so just to be, just to clarify, I, I wasn't saying that, that Microsoft gets revenues of millions from, from this data. Uh, I guess it's potential that, that organizations could get, you know, re, uh, obviously it's potential for, for organizations, developers, communities, citizen groups to get, to get, to monetize the value of the data coming out of the cloud, okay? But I think you, you, you mentioned a couple of things there which I'll address, which I think, I, I think is the, the nub of your question. So first of all, you were talking about the complexity of getting data out of operational systems. So this would be done with traditional uh, kind of ETL tools, extract, transform, load tools. But of course, because of the openness of the cloud, because of the open API capabilities, it's relatively easy to do that. I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my statements. I don't want to make it sound like, yeah, you can do any data, any time. But uh, as I said, with the, with the OData protocol, as an example, its, it's, it's deliberate uh, design is to enable data to be easily, more easily published into the cloud and more easily uh, taken out of the cloud. But of course, there will be complexities getting data out of some operational systems. These complexities are known and you know, there's various tools that you can, and techniques you can use to, to, to do that. Uh, the second part, I think you mentioned big data. Of course, big data is a challenge because of the volumes of data, uh, perhaps you know, regular updates, feeding, automated, automatic feeds, that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, um, this is where we see uh, different technologies working together in a way to make that easy to happen. So with Microsoft's Windows Azure Cloud Platform, for example, we work very seamlessly with uh, Heydu. Uh, that's, that would be our uh, one way that we would get big data uh, sources in, in and out of our cloud platform. And again, we can still use the OData protocol to, to get that data out. 
So it, from a cloud point of view, it almost doesn't care because it scales so well. Um, let me give you another example, actually, quickly, because I think it illustrates this very well. Okay, so what you're looking at here, and this kind of, hopefully this kind of illustrates the, the big data and uh, uh, real-time nature of this. This is a, uh, it's a live train map of the London Underground. And uh, if you watch the, uh, the icons, they're actually moving in uh, re near real time. And that, this is using that Transport for London data I showed you earlier on. So this interface uh, is built uh, using Google Maps, and I think it uses some PHP code at the back end. But again, showing the openness of the cloud, the back-end data is being fed through cloud through the Windows Azure platform. And you can see that uh, there's a tremendous amount of data that's being generated at the back-end here. And you can see that the, the, you know, the, the, the updates and the, the, uh, the, the way the application works in a very simple way, that update is almost seamless from an end-user point of view. So I think this illustrates quite well how a, a simple application can use near real-time data that's generated live through the, the Transport for London uh, API. OK, any other questions? Mirko. Do you know what my question is going to be? I would like to hear how the OData standard is um, developed, especially how the development process is governed. And um, if I could implement access to it from a purely free software-based solution. Uh, so let me take the second part. Um, I mean, it's an open protocol. Uh, it's, it's currently up for open standard uh, ratification to, uh, by the OASIS committee. So, uh, and again, you know, it's, it's a consortium of IBM, Microsoft, SAP, Citrix. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you could use any free software or any open source technology to, uh, to access it. And indeed, if you go on to odata.org, you will see many examples of where that's been done. Um, as to the development process, it's, it's just, uh, it, as I said, it's a consortium of uh, organizations. Um, and we are developing the protocol to be as open as we you know, practically can make it. And uh, uh, you know, it's a collaborative process between those different commercial organizations. And as I said, it, we've, we've put it up for uh, rat uh, open standards ratification with, with the OASIS committee. So I think that's something that's in progress. Uh, it's made available under the open specification promise, yeah. OK. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'm available if you guys have any other follow-up questions. But uh, thank you for staying awake.